think we are recording. It is recording. Okay, you got it? You see it? Okay, good. Thank I see you. it up there. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, well, welcome everyone. I'm Craig Finfrock, and uh, you have joined us to the when the dust settles, retail rewired, a panel discussion on the retail sector in Tucson, Arizona. This program is produced by the Southern Arizona chapter of CCIM. Before we get to our panelists, I'd like to take a couple of, uh, make a couple of announcements. First of all, I'd like to uh, uh, recognize uh, our sponsors for Southern Arizona CCIM. Without them, we would not be able to put for these programs and all the things that we do throughout the year with the forecasts and uh, charity yeah. events and uh, all the thing, educational programs that we're able to put together during the year. We very much appreciate our sponsors. And uh, I would also like to make a quick announcement about uh, upcoming webinars. We have an industrial panel webinar scheduled for August 4th, an office panel webinar scheduled for August 18th, and a deals and drinks, a virtual deal making event scheduled September 2nd. And so please be sure to join us for those events. And uh, today we have several top uh, distinguished retail experts in Tucson, Arizona. We have Melissa Law, president, CCIM and president of Larson Baker Company. We have Brenna Lacey, vice president of Volk Company. Nancy McClure, ver first vice president of CBRE. And Dave Hammock, who is principal of Cushman Wakefield Pie Corps. We have a, a few, a list of pre-selected questions uh, that our panelists have had input in coming up with. And we're gonna mix it up today by picking from a list of questions and going around the circle and ask each one of our panelists to talk about that, the questions uh, individually. And then there will be time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers, a Q&A. And so please be sure to send in your Q&A on the chat line during the webinar and uh, which questions you'd like to direct those uh, or which panelists you'd like to direct those questions to and we'll do our best to get to them at the end of the webinar. And uh, I'd like to start with each of our panelists briefly just say a few words about how your business is doing and what changes you're seeing in our market. And let's start with Brenna and then go to Nancy and Melissa and Dave. Hi everyone, and thanks Craig for including me in the panel. Um, I, you know, I think when this all started, none of us probably knew what to expect um, uh, with such um, uh, quick and dramatic change uh, in the world and in the markets. Um, very briefly, uh, I'll just tell you that our business uh, at Vol Company is, is, is going great. Everybody's working really hard. Um, we've been able to close many deals that were in the pipeline <clears throat> when we entered this phase, um, a few have been pushed back, but for the most part, um, it's, it's stayed in place. Um, as companies sort of caught their breath, I think, from the initial uh, close down, um, the activity has been increasing. Um, we'll just see what's looming on the horizon. Now, a lot, we are still seeing lots of out-of-towners out come in with their money. Lots of people thinking of moving into the market right now and opening up businesses. I think maybe that with um, uh, second generation inventory coming on the market, that's gonna provide a lot of opportunity to people coming into the market. And I'll just share a couple of things on the personal front. First of all, um, I never thought I would enjoy working remotely <laughs> or that I could do it productively. Uh, and here I am spending most of my time remotely, even though our office is very nice, um, I prefer it. Um, I would say that with all the quick changes, I've become very intense about information gathering. I've been spending more time on, uh, on webinars uh, and in consultation with other people. Um, uh, it's a great time for a data geek, frankly. Uh, someone pointed out the other day that, uh, you know, in two months, we've had two years of changes um, and, you know, it's going to keep going on. So we need to keep on top of everything. 
And then the last change that I'll mention is just personal. Um, I don't hold any meetings without masks, so I carry us extra ones in my car. And I hope that everyone's staying safe. Thanks, Brenna. So um, to add on to what Brenna said, I, you know, our company luckily had been very proactive in getting us equipped well before the COVID just to be able to work wherever, whenever we wanted to. And so we had the, the uh, technology ready to go. So that was really helpful. Um, as far as, you know, the deal process, I, you know, early on and still today, I'm having conversations with clients um, that are more consultative, you know, where you sit there and you listen to what they have to say and you brainstorm and how to move things forward. And, you know, there's been a lot of really heavy stories that you hear. Um, so it's, it's, you know, a five minute, 10 minute conversation pre-COVID is oftentimes an hour long. And um, honestly, it's been a great way to really connect on a very deep level with clients um, on their strategies and processes and um, you know what's going on and how they're how they're being equipped um, and I um, I also have been doing a lot of rent deferral deals um, which honestly I've never done before but um, in a lot of ways it reminds me of the last recession where there was uh, you know it seemed like the collapse was over a much greater period of time this was almost like instantaneously overnight and it's shocking how many people really didn't have reserves in the bank to get through this. So um, I found that we, everybody came to the table, open-minded, open-armed, and said, let's get through this. And we found resolution. And each single conversation was different. Each resolution seemed to be very different. So, um, you know, I spent, I spent one month doing all of that and, and got paid for it. So it was, it was, um, it was a great win-win on everybody's side. Um, and, you know, it seems like now things are moving towards deal making um, in a very productive way. Deals that were on the table have gotten done or in the process of getting done and new deals are happening. I put a property into escrow last week and um, just talked to another guy today who wants to put an investment property on the market. So it's, um, it's feeling better, but we have a very long ways to go. So I'll pass it along and we'll get to some of the more meat of the, the context later. Melissa? Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, our company, Larson Baker, we're really from a landlord perspective. We have uh, about 3 million square feet of mostly retail um, and about 57 properties. So our business, if I had to describe it in uh, one word, it, it feels very capricious right now. I one day, maybe I could also say manic. One day I'm feeling really good because um, we're, we're really, our collections are up back in the 90s. Most of the deferrals are over. We're seeing some strong sales, which I'll get into from some of our tenants. Um, we're seeing some actually really robust uh, leasing activity from relocations and other tenants that are looking to make a change. And then other days I feel really down. You know, we have bad news trickling in. We have this kind of feeling where you can't be in denial that a lot of our tenants and a lot of the consumer is really propped up right now by stimulus. So it may feel good for June, um, but when that stimulus wears off, you're really going to feel a different uh, feel a different market. Um, so I, I kind of go day by day, but Larson Baker's business and its portfolio is. Um, relatively strong and uh, in a little bit I'll talk about kind of what we've done as a whole um, during this period and especially during the, uh, the shutdowns. The latest thing we're dealing with and this kind of lends to the manicness is we're now dealing with um, additional shutdowns and so when you think you're you're out of it and the worst is over you know gyms get shut down and movie theaters get shut down and to have to kind of go back and say, what do we do now? What do we do for the second round? Um, that's been really difficult. So over these last four months, we've really just taken it one day at a time, kind of triage any issues, work through our properties and our portfolios, get everything into a really manageable position. And we've been able to do that, but it's, it's really hard to feel good consistently or even look long-term about what this market's going to be over the next couple of years. Interesting. 
Dave, what are you seeing? I am seeing, uh, I echo a lot of what Nancy had said. I mean, we were all going 100 miles an hour and then, you know, all of a sudden everything uh, just stopped. And we did a lot, I, I helped a lot of landlords with a lot of uh, rent deferrals um, throughout April, pretty much the whole month. Uh, a lot of time on the phone, working out specific situations for each tenant. Um, and then activity in May started picking back up and it's continually picked back up, which is nice. I mean, additional, additional closures don't help. I mean, we're, we're working on fitness deals. Those are back on pause. So a lot of the deals that paused out uh, when everything stopped have picked back up in May and deals are just taking a lot longer right now from what I'm seeing. Uh, there's a lot of caution, which is understand. It's understandable, um, but for the most part, activity is building on itself and it's picking up as we go along. So it's very unpredictable what you know tomorrow brings, what next week brings. So, like Melissa said, you have to take it day by day. Right now, it's it's uh, an interesting time. That's for sure. There's there's a lot of change uh, in our in our future. CCIM's chief economist Casey Conway and others have said that co the COVID uh, nineteen pandemic and stay at home orders have accelerated the trend to online shopping by at least five years. So what's in store for the retailers and the shopping centers? What are some of the significant changes happening in our business? What does the future look like in your view? Let's go around again and, and start with Brenna and then go, uh, go to Nancy and Melissa and Dave on that question, those thoughts about that. Okay, so um, uh, based on some conversation we had as a panel earlier, I'm gonna concentrate my remarks on restaurants <clears throat> as we're talking about that specific question. And, um, I make notes, so I, I got to look down, sorry. Um, so, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's some things that we've already learned um, uh, during this, what seems to be short few months and long few months. Um, and then there's a lot to be revealed, obviously, as COVID persists. Um, the restaurant business is so stressed. So um, uh, he, here are some just bullet points about what I see uh, going on with restaurants right now. First of all, and you know, most of us know this, the concepts that have adapted most readily have been the drive-through concepts. Um, you know, drive-throughs are big drivers for the future, uh, for future formats, uh, and for investors. Um, you know, the drive-throughs are already popular with a lot of tenants, but now it's they're widening their appeal uh, to to, to quick-serve casual. You know, Chipotle is requiring them, and I think that's a trend that we'll be seeing. Seeing. Um, pivoting to delivery and curbside is also um, the big answer to keeping as many restaurant stores open, open as possible. Um, uh, you know, still, from what I'm hearing on the street, it has been rare uh, for a sit-down restaurant to be able to maintain more than 40 to 50 percent of their pre-COVID volume. It's just, um, uh, it's been a big pivot. Outdoor patio space uh, is now higher on tenant lists. Um, formats are going to change for the future. If you're looking toward the future, less seating inside, um, seating outside, dedicated curbside pickup areas, I think for everybody. Uh, ghost kitchen concepts have been going, growing around the country uh, that uh, do delivery only. Uh, so basically, when you think about it, the trends of the past decade in restaurants, uh, which have been all focused toward um, high energy and noise and, uh, you know, and crowding, you know, it's just exactly the opposite of what's being supported in this environment. Um, it's, uh, it's a big change. Um, I would also note that larger format restaurant inventory uh, is coming on the market already, and it's going to be harder to absorb. Um, obviously, there's a move toward efficiency of space. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and so owners are going to, you know, obviously we have to look at uh, what can be done with existing buildings to either uh, cut them down, lower rents, um, you know, come up with creative ideas for the future. I was reading a, a Warren Buffett quote the other day, which I thought is pretty colorful and accurate. Uh, he, he put it, when the tide goes out, 
we find out who's been swimming naked. <laughs> and that is definitely true with the PPP money running out uh, at the end of July. It's summer in Arizona. Restaurants use their high season uh, success to fund their low season needs. And, um, you know, it's just a tough time depending on the financial runway that these people have uh, to be able to do that. And then my last comment is uh, on this, is that there were huge misses in the first round, uh, you know, you alluded to that already, of restaurant and bar reopenings related to masks and large gatherings. And it, it's just making it worse now for operators and commerce in general. I feel terrible uh, for, especially for these restaurant operators who put so much time and money um, into uh, trying to accommodate safety uh, for their clientele. And some of them just can't even afford to reopen, um, you know, for a second time. So I, I just think that's a, you know, that's a shame until, until uh, customers get enough confidence to come back into public spaces. It's going to be a rough ride. It's, it's really sad to see what's going on. Nancy, why don't you answer that uh, question about what's in store in the future uh, with a, a look towards the investors? So um, I think I'm going to get into a lot more detail about investment later in the program. But, um, you know, initially, I would say that what we're hearing from investors is, um, you know, they're looking for some assurity. They're looking for assurity in, in the quality of tenants, uh, their, their, the rent roll that they might be buying. And uh, before they really buy, they're going to want to see that the stores are reopened, how their sales are going. Um, and right now, it's almost impossible to find lend lenders who will lend on retail. So, um, you know, we've got a lot of people right now in the market, the, what I call the vultures, the ones that have cash on hand that are just putting out really low offers. Um, I don't think the market's there yet for most of the sellers, but I think, um, I think on the whole, we're going to see a major um, transfer of wealth in our community in particular, because a lot of what is owned in retail is locally owned, not always the caliber, well, not the caliber of Larson Baker always, um, but it's, you know, it's people that are less sophisticated, maybe don't have as much money on the sidelines to do what's going to have to be done to their properties and, um, or the, the wherewithal to withstand the next it could be three to four years of really tough time retail. So I'll pass the ball. Melissa, if you would uh, please uh, answer that question about uh, what's in store uh, f for the future uh, and this how this trend to online shopping is affecting everything with uh, look towards malls and and shopping centers. Sure. Yeah, I don't, at this point, I don't like to forsake anything. You know, you hear a lot of things about this is dead. Men's formal wear is dead. Retail shopping is dead. Uh, you know, jumping, jumping places, adventure places are dead. Uh, and I don't like to do that. Rest, full service restaurants are dead. They, those have been obviously significantly impacted right now with the environment we find ourselves in but I think it's, it's really too early to tell if they're gone forever. If I had to kind of make one big opinion uh, or forsake something, it would probably would be the traditional mall as we know it. I think, I think uh, if I had to say something is dead, I would say malls are dead. And that's for two reasons. One is that the, it just, the trend is not there. People don't enjoy, there's no value proposition to be going to malls. And um, also you're seeing more and more vacancy, less anchors, Macy's, JCPenney's kind of going under. The second part of that though, is that mall tenants, particularly the smaller mall tenants have always paid a premium for being in the mall because of the value proposition and the, and the, the walking traffic that it's brought. You see malls like the Tucson Mall or anything, you're talking about $30 to $40 in just triple net charges, uh, let alone potentially $40 to $60 in, in base rent. And so as the value proposition starts to go away from malls and that continuation goes on, you're going to start to see an exodus of tenants that are within malls, and that's always been their business plan, but 
that that no longer works, but there are still solvent companies. I mean, think of Sephora, think of Foot Locker, think of, you know, all of those small stores you see, I think you're going to see a shift of the business model. And what I'm hopeful for as a mostly kind of outdoor lifestyle center, strip center landlord, is that we're going to start to see a bigger pool of tenants that are no longer going to be going into the malls. Uh, if I could, you know, if this works and, and this trend we see, the park mall, if tenants start to exit the park mall, we've got the Plaza at Williams Center at Broadway Craycroft, which for a long time in the 80s, 90s, uh, really was a lifestyle retail center. We could get some of those tenants that like the walkability, that like the um, kind of visibility and is also still really close to the park mall and we could pick up that mall vibe again and really be a winner as the transition from, from indoor malls continue. I still think it's, you know, walk through malls like uh, La Cantata and I would say the premium premium of the malls like Fashion Square are gonna exist, but traditional malls, I think you will see the demise um, and, and hopefully that's a gain for strip centers and, and outdoor lifestyle centers. Definitely the B and C malls. Yeah. Uh, Craig, could I add one quick comment to that? You because bet. Um, I agree with everything that Melissa just said. And the one thing that I would add on to that too, um, to support it, is that um, uh, there's going to be contraction because in the malls because the co-tenancy clauses are going to give a lot of people outs. So they're going to have an opportunity to move without a problem. So it's going to be a one more thing. House of Cards. Mm -hmm. Dave, why don't you take that question about this uh, accelerated trend to online shopping uh, with a, a viewpoint of the retailer, the strip strip center retailer? Where are you seeing? Sure, I think there's already been, and we've already seen it over the last several years. There's been a shift to service versus retail, and for example, a traditional grocery and food shopping center. If you look at the text. In most of these, you have a nail salon, you have a restaurant, you have a little fitness club. You know, those are service. It's, it's things that are immune from the internet. And I think what we're going to see, we just saw it with GNC filing for bankruptcy. I mean, we've got, we've got, GameStop. I mean, you have tenants like Sally Beauty. I mean, they are going to have tremendous competition from the internet. And I, I think that uh, we've been seeing it and I think it's going to be uh, accelerated. Honestly, I think we're going to see a lot more, you know, in the near future of some of these retailers. Uh, so I think what we're going to see in grocery anchored centers is uh, more of a push towards services that are immune to the internet. So. Sure. Well, let's keep going on that track a little bit. Nancy, there have clearly been uh, some retail successes during the COVID stay-at-home months. What have you heard on those essential businesses? Well, you know, let's start from a comment that I said a little while ago. You know, when this thing started, it was, it was an unprecedented event and it was like Hurricane Katrina hitting the entire world all at one time, you know, shutting down everything. And we've never seen that before. And so, you know, I think the, the retailers, you know, obviously it was a shock, you know, you know, that they had to really pivot fast and they had to, to, they had to respond by most of them closing down. So, you know, in this, we've seen some real winners. Um, you know, the essential retailers, like you said, um, grocery stores, um, you know, their sales had a great bump between 30, 50% during uh, the worst time of COVID. Um, everybody just hunkered down and they were looking for daily needs. That was about it. You know, obviously we've heard the whole story about toilet paper, but um, it was daily needs that everybody decided. And that's what happens when people are starting to lose their jobs and the stock market is crazy and and you know th there's just all this uncertainty so people so they know and what they need so they stockpiled up um what we found in all of that was that the supply chain really didn't um wasn't there wasn't responding so um you know that's going to entail some changes down the road and you know hopefully we'll see some benefit from that and 
leasing some space because I think we're going to need a whole lot of cold storage and other midtown storage for that really quick restocking the shelves kind of attitude, which we didn't have. Um, accordingly, um, with grocery stores, they say that typically they plan for their purchasing of toilet paper to stock once every six months. I mean, they have it in, in a warehouse and they, they order enough for six months at a time. Well, they needed a whole lot more of that because people were just freaked out about it. So um, drug stores also did very, very well. Um, you know, there's, you know, the need for medications and, you know, there's, you know, sleeping pills and things that people need on a daily basis. Um, the other one was hardware stores. With all of us hunkered down at home, we're looking around and uh, making our honeydew list and uh, getting some things done. Um, hardware stores saw a nice bump of 25 to 75% increase in sales. I was um, running around about a week and a half ago, I stopped by a friend's Ace Hardware store, and I said, you know, how are you doing? And she said, honestly, this last month, which would have been June, um, she did 75% more in sales than she did the prior year, the prior June. Um, in May, she did 50% more in sales than she did the prior May. So, you know, there's some people that really were winners in that, and she was really nimble and had the ability to be nimble in um, what she ordered. So, you know, I think that's, that's indicative of, you know, how you can be successful. Um, Brenna was talking about restaurants and, um, you know, in talking with the restaurants, both national locals here, um, the ones that really are formatted to have pivoted fast enough to do the takeout and really understood that model, um, didn't see a tremendous decline, but most of them saw at least a 25% decline in sales. Um, the more the larger format sit down, uh, some of them didn't ever reopen. Uh, some of them tried takeout, but they were reporting their sales had declined anywhere from, you know, 50 to 70% off. Some of them even higher than that. So they were not the winners in all of this. But, um, you know, I think through all of this, in fact, I was talking to a really good client of mine yesterday who's in the quick serve restaurant. You know, he said, I've used this time where we're a little bit slower to really figure out how we're going to move forward and be technology savvy and be able to meet the needs of the customer, where the customers are going. Not necessarily where they are right now, but they're, he's trying to project where the customers are going to be at in the future, which I think is brilliant. And um, those, those retailers that have been able to get into that um, space of being online, being very usable and you know figure out how they can get the merchandise to you has been um those have been the winners so clearly amazon's been the winner but um, hopefully they will, will move their patterns of online shopping back into local stores here soon once everybody seems to get reopened yeah and, uh, good answer and, uh, grub hubs and groupons and so well, that's, that's, I want to say, say one thing about that because the restaurants, you know, a lot of people will opt to go that route, but Grubhub and, and DoorDash and all, they take about 30 to 50% yeah. of the profit from the restaurant. So if you're going to order, order it directly from the restaurant. Um, and, you know, a lot of the restaurants are trying to figure out how they can deliver directly rather than going through those delivery services. Yeah, I've heard that. Melissa, how's the reopening going in your view? What, what are your tenants doing differently to adapt and survive the COVID crisis? And what is Larson Baker doing to adapt and, and get through this? Yeah, um, the reopening is going um, okay. I mean, obviously we're having setbacks and I'm a little bit concerned that our governor is going to go in the way of other governors around, which is more of a significant stay at home order. So the reopening when it happened, uh, you know, on around May 10 went pretty well. As of right now, all of our businesses have reopened except for gyms, our movie theater at Crossroads Festival Roadhouse, and then a couple kind of random stragglers that have just fell off the face of the planet month, uh, month one. And the data since reopening has been surprising and not surprising. So Nancy went over the, the winners. 
the, the big losers have been um, anything senior focused. So anything that their clientele was mostly seniors or older people is just, they're just being decimated. Um, in our portfolio, think miracle year. You know, most of those people are 80 years old. They're just not going to do it. Um, we have the U of A All a Lifelong Learning Institute, which is classes for seniors. They're thinking they're probably not going to start doing classes until January. So that's a real problem that we have to solve and figure out together how to, how to solve it. Um, but some of the, the sales data that has come back from some of our traditional retailers since opening has been really, really promising. So some of our soft goods um, has their, their numbers in May were the best numbers they've ever had historically in the history of that location. And that, that almost blew me over because I just didn't, I know that there was pent up demand, but if you think about kind of the numbers of shoppers that were feeling comfortable to go out in May, that was really limited. And yet we're seeing very strong soft good sales. I can say that for Bells, I can say that for Ross, I can say that for Home Goods, I can say that for TJ Maxx, I can say that for Skechers. Um, obviously being closed for 60 days, you know, is, is way more of a loss to counteract any sort of uh, increases since they've been opening, but it was promising to see the retail pent up demand in, in soft goods. Um, you know, fast casual, I'm seeing mixed, I'm seeing mixed results. Our Coldstone franchisee, he's up 12%. And he, Grubhub and um, some of the delivery services have actually been a winner for him because he's just taken the cost of the ice cream and he's, he's bumped it up 25%. And the consumer hasn't minded, it minded, hasn't minded. Um, and he's not able to take such a loss. So his, his sales are up and he's doing pretty well. We're seeing our, our kind of um, the Jersey Mike's of the world doing well. And then our, our full format restaurants are very challenged. I mean, we would be lucky that they're doing maybe 50%. Although Olive Garden during the downtime, they were, they were sticking to 75% of their sales doing takeout, um, which, really pleasantly shocked me. Wow. Dave, what are the retail clients that are active in, in your centers and which ones are no longer active and how have their businesses changed and what are they doing differently to get through this? Sure. Uh, you know, with activity right now, there doesn't seem to be much rhythm with it. Uh, you know, I'm working on, I'm working on deals with salons right now. And then you'll talk to another salon and expansion is the furthest thing in your mind. Uh, you know, the same thing with, uh, with some restaurants. I mean, some restaurants are doing fine as everybody's mentioned and some are not. Um, so the last shutdown as well, the, uh, uh, we were working on some fitness as well. So those are, those are paused currently, but, uh, you know, currently I'm working with, uh, you know, two examples of groups that are, that have done well. Uh, I'm working with Salad and Go, who's expanding into Tucson, and they're, they've been doing very well uh, during COVID. Uh, Dollar General, obviously, an essential retailer, they're, they've done fine, both very bullish on expansion. So uh, those are two examples of groups that really have not been affected and, you know, they just have eyes on new markets and new territories to expand into. Um, but, you know, there's not a lot of rhythm right now as far as, as far as shop and lease deals. Some are expanding, some are hurting. Uh, so it's all over the board right now, I guess is what I'm trying to say for, uh, for lease deals. Um, the, uh, I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, let's go to Brenna. Uh, who are the retailers or retail categories that are struggling, uh, in your view, uh, the most during the COVID? And and give us a little insight as what the possible future holds for them. Okay. And I'm not going to um to to piggyback on something that Melissa said. Um, I'm of the same mind, Melissa, where I don't say this category is dead or that category is great. 
Um, and, and, you know, as Dave pointed out, there's just, there's no rhythm, there's differences, but there is, I mean, there certainly is a lot of data uh, and there's been a lot of history before we went into this, um, <clears throat> into this crisis. So um, there are certainly uh, tenants and categories that have been struggling and, you know, sometimes all you need is a, um, uh -oh. shame on me. <laughs> Well, at least it was me in that. Plug it in. Sorry, I turned it off. Okay, and then um, wait a sec. That's embarrassing. Okay. Um. So, but I do have. It, it's not just my feelings. Uh, there, there's some good research going on right now about some categories. So I'm going to share some of that um, with you um, uh, anecdotally, and and some of it's already been said. So. Um, as Melissa pointed out, her, the, the soft goods retailers that you mentioned, those are all discounters. <laughs> so, um, you know, traditional apparel is just having a heck of a time. They've had a heck of a time before this started. They're in the malls mostly, and they are just overstored, and that's just a tough category. So um, we can look at that as a problem. Um, luxury brands. Not that we have that much of it in Tucson, but we do have some. Luxury brands um, uh, have been in a downward trend for some time, uh, partially because instead of growing their um, customer base over time, they've just been raising their prices because the clients all would absorb the prices. So they're not in a good position uh, to, to, to do well. And there's a lot of closings and mergers expected in the whole luxury brands um, category. Um, I want to talk about theaters um, uh, a little bit because it's it's such a tough uh, category um, and it's a lot of important real estate um, and um, it I think it has an interesting innovative uh, future. So I heard I, I'm gonna I'm gonna read some of this. I heard someone recently ask a retail consultant, "What do you think the hail mary is for the um, uh, for the theater business?" And he really couldn't come up with a great answer. Um, you know, one of the things he said was, well, I think the theaters should have immediately pivoted to showing um, films in their parking lots at night and selling concessions in their parking lots, which they haven't done generally. And then the next day I read in the paper that Walmart is actually planning to do that in some of their uh, parking lots across the country. So good for Walmart, they figured it out and, uh, you know, are gonna do it, but, um, uh, the situation with AMC right now is just a really good little uh, scenario to look at uh, about the, the theater business because they've got three suitors right now, um, you know, because they're weakened. Um, uh, there's Disney and um, Netflix and Amazon. They're all after AMC, if, if you believe what you read. And I, I think that's very interesting. I was talking to a client the other day and he said, can you imagine Disney running theaters? I mean, they are so about experience. Um, they control so much product. They could develop um, party rooms with themes that the kids would be, you know, dragging their parents in there for a year or two, as long as the theme would last. Um, and you know, with any of these companies, they're all they all have strong um, distribu. They have product distribution. I mean, that's what the theater business is a lot about: is the, is getting the product. And um, so they control a ton of that. And, um, you know, they have a subscription model that can be marketed into the theaters. So I think it's going to be very interesting to watch the theaters. I, you know, any, um, I mean, I have clients who own theaters and um, uh, it's hard to know how to plan exactly for the future, but I think that there will be some innovative things that come out of the theaters. Um, the other thing that I would mention is fitness centers. Um, you know, we're still seeing activity from, um, smaller fitness groups, you know, the, the Orange Theory Fitnesses of the World, yoga studios, um, I think they will continue um, to grow and to do business. Um, people definitely like that. But the fitness market is, be, market is being further split um, by online uh, fitness training. Um, there's just been a huge uptick uh, in there. I know a lot of my friends have done it. Um, since COVID started, people are working out at home. And um, I saw the other day that Lululemon, that, uh, you know, it's a huge seller of um, uh, athleisure wear, as they say, 
they bought a company called Mirror for online uh, fitness, which is a great synergistic move on their part. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if any of the other panelists um, have feelings, but you know, I, I, about this, but we're going to really have to pay attention to the larger operators. Um, they've got a big nut to crack uh, with these facilities, and um, you know, it's it, it's 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 a tough one. Oh, I also saw that um, Gold's Gym has come out with a um, a new prototype that's less expensive uh, for their franchisees to build. So you know, they're trying to come up with some solution, but. Um, I don't know what it will be, but we got to watch those fitness centers. Melissa, what have you done to help your tenants financially and what changes are being made to your properties to help uh, the tenants adapt to this changing environment? So portfolio wide, we have done 110 um, lease modifications out of 500. So about 20 to, I don't know, 23 percent of our tenants receive some sort of uh, rent help during this time. And the, the breakdown of that is about 70 just straight deferrals, where we took the rent that was owed and we kind of said, pay it back to us in, in 2021 or 2022. Then about 30 of those were blend and extends, where we took this opportunity with the near term at you know, anywhere from 18 months or less to extend their, their lease in consideration of actually abating that rent. And those for us are just winners all day. We'll take kind of long lease renewals um, and give up some rent in the short term. And then about 10 or 12 were kind of weird ones where we negotiated out some negative lease provisions, whether that be like a co-tenancy, an early termination option, a prohibited use, something that kind of gave value back to us as the landlord in consideration of, of some sort of um, rent help. And most of those periods of deferment or abatement have um, started to drop off now. And so we're seeing our full portfolio going back to full rent. And then what we're seeing as a result of that is, you know, tenants coming back to us for a second, uh, a second piece of the pie. We're just saying, we're not doing enough sales to see it. But for the most part, our collections have continued to go up and, and stay pretty stable. Um, and yeah, we're, we're trying to do some innovative things to help um, tenants, whether that be you know, give them a lot more latitude on signage, uh, you know, help their visibility. We actually have three tenants right now, three restaurant tenants that they're putting a walk-up window in their storefront so people can walk up. You kind of slide the window and do the transaction uh, without them having to go in. Uh, it costs like $4,000 to do that, which has been surprising to me, but, um, uh, and then also trying to utilize the parking, designating parking spaces for delivery, designating parking spaces to just help on the, uh, the convenience of pickup food. Um, and we're trying to, we're trying to get really creative. Long term, I want to get really creative about our parking lots. I don't know. I just want to use them and repurpose them and, and earn revenue on them in some way. And I'm hoping that we can come up with some creative ways to do that. Interesting. It's going to be uh, a lot going on. Dave, which of your projects are you seeing the most activity in? And in, in which ones are, are not getting activity? And tell us why you think some of these projects are doing better and others not so good. You know, centers that I have are well located, high traffic, uh, desirable, some class A uh, centers that I have in the that are historically close to 100% uh, in good times and bad. We've, you know, we have tenants that have stumbled and we have tenants backed up, I mean, waiting for the spaces to come available. So those centers have done very well. Uh, well located centers, uh, a great example. Um, the Trader Joe's Center. We just, uh, you know, choose fitness vacated. I mean, we're 
at least on the 18,000 square foot uh, box that we have there. We have a 6,000 square foot end cap um, because of the ground lease has been uh, available for quite some time and we're about to execute a lease on that. So that center is about to get to 100% uh, leased uh, with other groups that were, you know, we could almost pick the tenants that we wanted to get. So I think the quality of the project, the location, I think makes all the difference right now um, with, with what's doing well and what's not. Mid block centers, I think a lot of those tenants, you know, if they're going to try to expand, they're going to try to upgrade and move into more corner property or a, a strong anchored property. So that's what I've seen. Yeah, well, it's not surprising. And you do have a lot of good shopping center locations and it's always about location. Brenna, let's talk about this consumer for a couple of minutes and we're sailing through this webinar. So I wanna hit on some of these other uh, uh, topics before we uh, get through this. How has the COVID crisis affected the consumer patterns and retail projects uh, down the road? And, and then I wanna hear Nancy talk about that too. Okay, great, great. So um, I sat in on a really interesting seminar um, uh, oh, a couple of weeks ago with an, uh, you know, a, a data group, an AI group. And um, they were on top of everything that's going on um, just from, you know, being on the ground and measuring uh, consumer behavior from all, all different standpoints. And so I got a lot. Now, before I get into some of that, though, I want to say that one big takeaway as a general comment for me was that small changes in consumers' lives and behavior affect a big retail changes. And, you know, when we went through the last um, big recession, I remember at the time I was able to look, it was, it was very different, right? It, I mean, it was, it was all financial, but I was able to look at that and, and along with a lot of other people and predict that the trend for the next decade was gonna be discount shopping. I mean, that, that was easy to look at and figure out. Well, now there's so many, um, COVID has gone so deep and for so long so far, and it depends on how much longer, uh, you know, we're in these circumstances because habits change over time. Um, that is, you know, there's gonna be a lot of different uh, impacts, but there's also gonna be opportunities created. I mean, one thing, um, uh, to remind everyone who's listening is that the retail, the retail business is, is so dynamic. I mean, you know, I've been in it for 40 years and I've seen, um, uh, and you too, uh, Nancy and Craig, you've seen, um, you know, formats go from grocery stores. When I started, they were at like 18,000 feet and then they ended up at a hundred thousand. Then they went back to, you know, I mean, it just, things do flow. So, you know, the retail real estate is used to having to make change. Um, uh, so I thought it would be interesting to just not just throw out answers, but just to throw out some, some thoughts and some questions um, for everybody um, uh, to think about. Um, people are going to have more time on their hands if they're staying, if they're working at home more. So there's less getting ready for work. There's less commuting. And then there's a whole new sets of wants and needs that arise from having that time on, on, on one's hands. So one thing that we know is that athletic wear, I mean, come on, we all look nice on the top, but maybe we have our yoga pants. <laughs> um, so that's going to remain really a big deal. Um, one thing I hadn't thought about is that peak hours for businesses are already changing. Um, Nancy talked about how busy grocers have been. Well, their peak hours have changed. You know, it used to be the weekends. Now it's the mornings and the weekdays. I mean, that causes a change in operations. I hadn't even thought about that, frankly. Um, maybe we can meet our friends for a long, relaxing, big lunch if we have more free time instead of a big dinner. When does cocktail hour really start? Um, uh, you know, I think, but it, cha it changes consumer behavior when these things um, come up. Um, another thing, booming housing sales. My friends in the residential um, real estate market here in Tucson tell me that houses are flying off the shelves. I mean, they don't completely understand it, but it is happening. And so, um, you know, with, with all those new housing sales and in migration to our market, um, 
there have been huge home improvement purchases in, in this beginning of COVID. Um, even after those cool off, if there's, you know, if there's more and more home sales, there's going to be more home improvement and design oriented um, sales coming up. So that's something to watch. Um, you know, travel, travel affects retail. Um, it, not only for specific markets, you know, like we, who that rely on tourism, um, uh, but uh, also there's just Winnebago sales. Winnebago sales have been off the charts. I don't know if you all know that. It's crazy. So people are starting to think differently over time. Uh, I don't know how much will stick and how much won't, but what will a vacation look like? Are we still going to take those long fancy trips or are we going to stay closer to home and do things differently? Um, so that will affect retail. And then um, uh, the last thing that I would say is just that is going back to the restaurant is that the, uh, the drive throughs and the patios and the curbside, um, it's, it's not just a matter of what works for the consumers, but we're gonna have to plan that on the project development side. Like, like you were saying, Melissa, I mean, it, uh, if you're planning a new shops building, I haven't worked on a new shops building that doesn't have a drive through somehow around the building. I mean, it's crazy to do it any other way um, if you can handle it. So that's, that's something to think about too. That's what I Nancy, what are your some of your uh, thoughts about the con uh, how the consumers are responding and what changes are ahead? So in June, Apple Mobility with your phone they track you, and um, Apple Mobility was seeing that people were going back into stores, and um, Google reported an increase of forty two percent of people querying what's open near me. So people are interested in getting back out. Um, and the early statistics on sales have shown a definite V. Obviously, I think going back down, it could be a W, could be a multiple, you know, Vs along the way. I think it's going to be a bumpy ride. But, um, you know, there's robust sales that increased 70 to 80 percent. May reported sales of an increase of 18 percent, which far exceeded expectations. Um, you know, I think that there's some optimism that we're going to get back to pre-COVID sales for most industries. Um, however, if you really, when you really look at the consumer, there's a lot that are very, very stressed. Um, a lot have lost their jobs. A lot have gotten, you know, behind in payments. And so that's going to be the priority for a lot of people. The other thing that we've seen um, is that the affluent people um, have been... Um, very uh, much not in a spending mode. Um, those that have money that could spend, they're just not spending. Um, and that's a big curiosity. Um, but it's, um, I think consumers are getting retrained on how they uh, get merchandise. So I think they're also looking at what they need or don't need. And there's a lot of us who probably don't need anything in our lives. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's gonna be really interesting, but um, so I know we've spent a lot of time on this, so we can move on to the next topic. Well, there's a lot of doubt and uncertainty about what's uh -huh. uh, in the future for us, that's for sure. We're, we're, we're getting down to our last few minutes and there's so many questions uh, that haven't been asked. Uh, and one of the areas that we've kind of touched on a little bit because we've really opened this up and talked about a lot of different things uh, but uh, do you know should we talk about who I mean there's a lot of bankruptcies uh, that have already happened and more undoubtedly and there's going to be a lot of space on the market not just in the malls but uh, all over I mean who are some of the uh, uh, I mean, who's going to fill some of these spaces that are going to be coming on and what are the owners going to do to find solutions? Nancy, why don't you take that first and then we'll, we'll go around to the others. Right. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really important question for all of us um, that are in the industry and ownerships that own real estate. You know, it's said that in the U.S. there's going to be over a billion, I'll say that again, over a billion square feet of retail space that no longer resonates with how we use space. And so it's really gonna compel the market to look at things differently. 
And, um, and it's going to take owners, agents, really reevaluating how we reimagine, how we um, can redevelop. Um, and we got to think differently to make a paradigm shift in new merchandising plans because what has been our go-to uses are likely not going to be our go-to focus. So the challenge is going to be for all of us um, to really engage with our, our governmental entities as well because we've got some very draconian land use codes that won't let us maneuver as fast and as uh, forward thinking as we need to be. And so I've already been in contact with city and county um, development service people to see how we can start that conversation. And maybe that could be a future CCIM um, uh, talk. And uh, because I think they're interested because they're gonna lose a tremendous amount of um, tax. And it may never become retail sales tax again, but um, you know, there's a lot of uh, properties that could easily be demolished and put up multifamily in the middle of town rather than doing it on the periphery of town. Um, I don't think we're going to need any hotels in the near future because hotel industry is going to take three to five, four years to recover. So, um, you know, I think the way that, um, you know, ownership groups have looked at compensating agents has got to change because a lot of what we're going to have to be doing is consultative work and um, the fees that would be paid um, need to reflect that, that there's a lot of time involved in getting a property strategically planned so that you can make something of it. And uh, that could be anything from, you know, uh, consulting fees and retaining fees. Um, but getting a strategic plan in place is something that everybody should be looking at today while you have a little bit of downtime. Uh, look at other cities, look at what happened in very progressive cities and start thinking about what you can do with those properties. <clears throat> I think I alluded it to in one of the other questions on grocery stores that, um, you know, there's going to be some need for um, centralized cold storage and, you know, some old grocery stores could be the perfect fit for something like that. Um, but there's other things that may um, be needed and, and some of that requires rezoning. Um, so it's, I think we've got to walk arm in arm into the future with um, everybody who's got a vested interest and, you know, it's not them against us, it's them against a dying um, central core. So. Yeah. Well, Melissa, why don't you uh, go next with that question? What are we going to do to, I mean, who's going to fill the spaces and what do we need to do to get the spaces filled uh, that are going to be coming online? Yeah, I hate this question because I do not know the answer. I, I wish I had the answer and I wish I could tell you, like we've all been saying for the last couple of years, hey, it's going to be fitness centers and it's going to be experiential because that obviously doesn't feel like the right answer in the environment we have right now. So I, I really can't, I mean, I think you get, you get a box back. I think you have some, some options, whether that be uh, if it's really well located, maybe you can pick it up and it can be retail again. If it's not so well located for retail, maybe you can repurpose it to medical, like what, uh, Dave is doing at uh, Grant and Swan. I heard that's a medical use going into the old uh, shoes. You can deny me if I'm wrong, Dave. But um, uh, what it's gonna come down to, this is, this is very sad, but it's gonna come down to whoever can come in, whatever investor, whatever property owner that can come in at a low enough basis on these empty boxes. You know, the, the owners who own it right now who have too much in it, who had a, a tenant paying 15 or 18 bucks a foot that they're gone. They're never going to replace it again with that, with that rent because there's just an overabundance of retail. Those owners are probably going to lose it, could lose it. And, and the investors who are opportunistic and can come in and can buy it at a really low cost per foot, they're going to have enough money to be creative and repurpose the boxes in the way that they need so that they can have new life. And it's going to come down to economics, um, but that's the cycle I see. I mean, if, if you look at the malls of the world, what, what, 
what mo most malls have in common is that they're all really incredibly well located and they have a ton of parking. Those two things are huge advantages, but it has to be from an owner or a developer who has a low enough basis that they can put in the 60 to 100 to $150 that it's gonna to take to rethink these huge behemoth properties. Interesting. Brenna, what's your take on that question? I'm, I'm kind of in the same category as Melissa. I, I think, you know, everything is, is, is property specific, but I, I was just thinking, um, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond already announced that they're going to turn a bunch of their stores into distribution centers and, 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 and change up that format. Um, I, I don't have a big crystal ball at this point because everything is changing so fast. Um, uh, and I also think that there are interesting uh, dynamics and, um, you know, when you get into the details of tr uh, trying to make change, it's not just governmental, it's what um, uh, exclusives from a major tenant, you know, if I've got Costco in a project, what are they going to let me do on, um, on something next door? Um, there's all those kinds of things to be worked through. Um, I, I do agree that there would be some great uses to bring into good locations that include that um, that model of um, live, work, play. So residential being included would be a great thing in a lot of places. Um, we residential product is um, right now um, inadequate. Uh, there's not enough of it, evidently. And then also the market's moving toward um, more rentals. I heard I read something recently that said that. Um, 40%, what was it? 40% of seniors are um, renting. They're a huge part of the rental market. Everybody's been thinking about millennials, but also seniors have moved toward renting, uh, which is interesting. Um, so, you know, it, re it remains to be seen, but it's, it's going to, as, as Nancy said, it's a lot of square footage that's going to come back. So we're we'll, got to work on it. <laughs> yeah. And Dave, what's your perspective? Do you have anything to add to to this? You know, I, those were uh, pretty thorough, all three, and right on target, I think. Um, but I, I, you know, with medical and with just repurposing, you know, these boxes, I, it's just, it, it's hard, it's really hard to say right now. I mean, um, I wish we had a crystal ball <laughs> so we could see, but I think it's all going to, I, I don't think we it, we're going to find out, I mean, as we move forward and move through everything uh, and see how it all shakes out. Well, I, can I add one other thing? Do we have just bet. 30 seconds? Okay. I, I just want to end on this note, which I think that um, Tucson as a market um, is uh, well positioned for some gains. Um, people are wanting to move here for all the reasons that we um, know about Tucson and, and why we care about Tucson, um, uh, you know, and, and from all different age groups. Um, and uh, I also think that we did, none of us touched on local tenants versus national tenants. And I think that Tucson has a very proud um, and strong history of great local tenants that add character to our market. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's going to help us moving forward because we've always embraced that and um, we're going to see more of that. So. Well, I'm glad you touched on that, Brennan. And that was actually one of the questions that we didn't get to is, and maybe we can end on a, on a more positive note, hopefully. Uh, how does Tucson look compared to some of the other Western cities of similar size? I mean, have you been hearing from your clients and investors uh, how we're faring uh, overall compared to some of the other cities? I think we're getting more looks than we've ever gotten. I think that you know when, when you read the when you read the news, you see that there's a uh, there's a flight from a lot of urban areas for all kinds of reasons. Um, and there's also money that wants to leave those markets. So, uh, you know, we've recently closed on several investment properties and um, it's all been um, out of state buyers who, you know, feel strongly enough about our market that they're willing to put their dollars here. 
Was that uh, pre-COVID or pro-COVID? Uh, During COVID. Yeah. During COVID, I had one deal that went into escrow and closed in four weeks. I just saw, I got a, a mailing. I saw that uh, Debbie Hesloff just closed on her Dutch, Bro, uh, Dutch Bros Coffee, which we both sold one. Um, uh, it, there's more stories like that, but uh, no, it's, it's ongoing. Yeah. It's ongoing if, if, you, if you've got, you know, if you've got the properties that have the uh, the income stream and the, and the strength. Nancy, you're on the uh, National Retail Council for CBRE. Uh, what are you hearing about Tucson and uh, compared to some of your colleagues? Uh, what are they? Uh, how do we stack up? Um, you know, I think it's um, Phoenix seems to get more, you know, looks. I mean, as far as from a bigger picture, because it's <laughs> You know, a lot of our offices are much bigger metropolitan area, but, um, you know, Wallet Hub um, ranked Tucson as one of the top 10 communities in the likelihood of good recovery from COVID, so, and the fastest recovery, so hopefully that's good, but, um, you know, we have a lot of good things going for us, um, you know, I think we need to add to our employment base, um, a lot more diversity in our employment base, um, and, you know, Phoenix has secured a lot of those. Um, I think one of our biggest selling features is the University of Arizona. And we need to make sure that's always in our marketing materials because people care about that. They care about having a really strong university. And, and Pima Community College is also a very strong um, selling feature as well. So, um, you know, we have a lot going for us. Um, obviously, the lack of direct flight. But, um, yeah, I... I I think most retailers, and they sort of are still doing it during the last recession, you know, still even in the last year, they're looking for the easiest deal. So, um, you know, when, when you're talking to somebody like a Ross and, and it's, you know, it's a complicated deal, they'll go to somebody who's willing to do their kind of deal, which is a hard deal to make. But, um, you know, there's, there's always, um, opportunity in, in a place like Tucson. Um, I'm a strong believer in it. And we've always had on the whole a lot stronger sales um, per store than a lot of the Phoenix stores because Phoenix gets very diluted. And, you know, they put a lot of stores and then down here they might put, you know, two or three or maybe four, but they're not doing the volume of number of stores. So, so their sales don't get as diluted as they are, um, you know, in Phoenix. So, well, this uh, hour sure has gone by fast, and I just want to ask you guys uh, on the, you know, as we wrap up here, I mean, do you have any last minute thoughts you want to share about advice for uh, our uh, audience? Uh, you, you know, how, any advice you want to share on the way out? Well, I want to thank you all for your time. You have, uh, it's been a very interesting hour and what a great panel we've had and i also want to thank our sponsors uh our gold sponsors bbva compass and brightview and national bank of arizona title security Stuart title wells fargo and reality executives uh, without them uh, we wouldn't be anywhere and uh, uh, just wanted to do a quick reminder. We have uh, a couple of upcoming office uh, uh, webinars coming up. We have an office webinar that Gary Heinfeld's working on, uh, putting together right now on August uh, 22nd. And uh, oh, we have an industrial, the next one's the industrial panel webinar on August 4th. And then uh, we're doing a deals and drinks on uh, September second and uh sorry we didn't get to the q a but uh thank you all for tuning in and thank you uh to our uh panelists uh melissa dave nancy and brenna good job thank you thank you it was thank a you. pleasure bye everyone all right take care <laughs>